Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video we have my Game Week 16 team selection. I do have two free transfers but unfortunately my team is a bit of a mess. If you do enjoy today's video please do make sure you drop a like on the video and make sure to subscribe as well but without further ado, let's jump into it. So just to timestamp this video, I'm recording this at 11.30 p.m. on Wednesday the 6th of December, i.e. after all of the Wednesday games, and it is an absolute mess in FPL, and therefore it is an absolute mess in my brain as well, but the deadlines are coming thick and fast, so I have to record this now. So do bear in mind that I've just watched a load of football. I had some on different screens. I've been looking at the stats a little bit, and so my mind is a little bit scrambled, but we'll try and streamline that ahead of the deadline decisions video on Friday and also the deadline stream on the Saturday, and we will have to wait for different interviews updates, different maybe early team news, pieces of rotation, press conferences as well. And that will all help to inform our decision making going into game week 16. But game week 15, I mean, it's been a terrible week for pretty much everyone. The fact that I'm on 30 points and as things stand, I'm on a small green arrow kind of tells you everything you need to know about game week 15. It's been a bit of a disaster, but I am just over the moon that I'm not on a massive red and I still have three players left to play on Thursday as well. My defense is a major issue at the moment, which we'll discuss in the next section. It really didn't do very well this week. So far, I've had four of them play. I've got three one-pointers. I've had a, a no show from Simicast and Trippier is yet to play. So I'm not really expecting much more from him based on what I've seen from the rest of my defense. Just an absolute disaster. But clean sheets are very uncommon at the moment in FPL. And when clean sheets do occur, it's very difficult difficult to predict when teams will do it, as was the case with Aston Villa keeping a clean sheet against Man City. Yes, Aston Villa are fantastic at home, and yes, Man City do struggle in the absence of Rodri, but I don't think anyone was saw a clean sheet coming there. So clean sheet's very unpredictable at the moment, but still not very nice to get a combined three points from four defenders. The midfield is where all of my points pretty much come this week, but no one did particularly well. Saka got a single assist with no bonus points. Salah blanked, but obviously with captaincy, that was six. As we suspected with Salah, his minutes would be managed in this game. I said there was a small chance he'd be benched and if he doesn't get benched, he'll come off early and that did happen. And it just feels like the sort of fixture where they can probably get away with giving Salah an early sub. It just so happened that Liverpool didn't put Sheffield United to the sword as we thought they did, as we thought they would and they kind of struggled a little bit. But Salah did get a bit of a rest, which probably means moving forward, he'll start every game or at least we would suspect him to. That was probably the extent of the rest that he's going to get. But a little bit disappointing to get a blank from Salah, but I suppose at least he outscored half. Ireland. Martinelli was the real hero of the game week. I decided very last minute to keep Martinelli. The plan was always to sell Martinelli for Palmer, which would have worked out in the end, but Martinelli getting a return was massive for me. I felt like my patience was finally rewarded, and I probably have hung on to him for too long, but it was nice to finally see a goal. I do want to sell Martinelli anyway in the near future, but it was nice to get some differential points for once. Embermo scored his third penalty of the season. He was looking pretty good, but then he went off injured. I think it was in the 40th minute, and now just provides a further issue for our teams that we really didn't need on top of everything because he actually looks pretty good for game week 16. But it was nice to get a goal before he went off injured. Otherwise, it probably would have been a one-pointer. Darwin Nunez. What do I want to say about this man? Benched, as we expected, comes off the bench, gets booked for kicking the ball away, and then gets an assist in the last minute. And he also missed a reasonably big chance as well just before that. I mean, it is the Darwin story. It's what you get with him. It's just completely unpredictable and chaotic. But he did get three points, which is three times what Watkins got. It's more than Haaland. So I can't complain too much, but maybe hoping for a little bit more when we saw him come off the bench. Watkins blanked, yes, and got a booking, but Villa at home are unbelievable. And I guess I'll discuss Watkins, Alvarez, and Haaland all together here. Alvarez continues to struggle, and he continues to get early subs, and Man City fans are continuing to, to call for Alvarez to get benched. The issue is, they just can't really do that at the moment, unless they want to play like Kovacic from the start or something in the Alvarez role, but they just don't have the players really to rest Alvarez. But I'm kind of a little bit worried that he might be benched against Luton. The only perhaps saving grace is that he did come off pretty early, like the 65th minute or something like that, Alvarez. So that maybe makes me think that he was being saved a little bit for the Luton game, or was he just pulled off because once again, he had a pretty poor game. I am a little bit worried about Alvarez long-term, but I guess I'm hoping it'll be available for game week 16. 
Watkins blank, but like I said, Villa were fantastic and he did have chances to score. And it just goes to show Watkins in any game at home, you, you kind of got to play him. And I was tempted with the, the team that I had to maybe bench him in game week 16 against Arsenal, but I want to play him now. We saw how good they are and they will create chances against absolutely anyone. So Watkins and Villa, absolutely brilliant. And especially at home, we want to play their assets. And then Harlem blank him, unlucky for owners because he had an absolutely monster chance. Martinez saved it. He then had another big chance and Martinez saved it again. So brilliant from Martinez, maybe poor from Haaland. But after the 11th minute, this is a crazy stat that I saw on Twitter. After the 11th minute, Man City accumulated zero XG. So after the 11th minute, after Haaland got those chances, Man City didn't create any goal attempts, which is bonkers. If you think about how good Man City are and how many chances they usually create, that Villa made them completely nullified their attack. So a few things to think about going into game week 16. But for game week 15, I mean, the best score that I've seen is about 35, 40. And the worst score that I've seen is about 15. So do let me know what you got down below. But really, none of us have lost a massive amount of ground and none of us have gained a massive amount of ground. But we do have a deadline coming thick, uh, very, very soon on Saturday. So let's take a look at my team. So looking ahead to game week 16, let's try and make a bit of sense of the mess in FPL at the moment. And I'll be entirely honest, I really hate my team. There are several players that I would like to take out. So I really need to just relax, sort of step back, take a look at my team in its entirety and think about the priority transfers this week. I would be extremely surprised if I don't use both of my free transfers this week, simply because there are so many players that I would like to remove from my team. The plan is currently not to get Erling Haaland in for a couple of reasons, which I'll explain when we move on to the forwards and my possible transfer plans. And therefore, I've got two transfers to sort out issues in my team. And like I said, I just need to prioritize which of the issues I need to sort this week, then which ones can I sort in 17, and then which are the ones that need to be sorted going into blank game week 18. And I don't want to book in transfers, but almost plan out in which order I'm going to prioritize the issues in my team. So that's the way I'm currently thinking about it at the moment. But it is nice to have two free transfers. It is nice to have a bit of money in the bank and the team value is stacking up nicely. Just before we start looking at the players, a little call out for you. Please do subscribe to the channel if you have not yet done so. I don't really ask as much because I begged in the lead up to 100k for people to subscribe. But I'm just looking at the stats now. 46.3% of you that watch these videos don't subscribe to the channel. So if everyone that didn't Everyone that's watching the video that isn't currently subscribed, subscribe. I'll be on over 200,000 subscribers, which is crazy. So please do subscribe to the channel if you've not yet done so. Now, moving on to the team, I actually do have Ariola in net despite me bringing in Dubravka last week. And yes, Newcastle are a much better defense. And on top of that, Fulham did just put five goals past Nottingham Forest. So I'm not necessarily expecting a clean sheet for Ariola, but if I was to bet, I think Ariola is more likely to keep a clean sheet than Dubravka, although I'm not set on this and I may just back the better defence. Newcastle are a stronger defence. I think Fulham and Tottenham could both score goals in these games. So maybe I just back the better defence. And if you told me Newcastle were to keep a clean sheet away at Spurs, I wouldn't be overly surprised. Obviously, if it was at home, then I would definitely be back backing Dubravka. But the fact that it's away makes me think... I might be able to just back Ariola here. I would love to know down below, if you do have Ariola and Dubravka, who are you currently starting? I'm just about leaning Ariola at the moment. Right, let's move on to the defense. So I would go as far as saying that everyone apart from Taylor is a potential issue in my defense. I'll start with Kieran Trippier. Unfortunately, I'm having to record this before they play on Thursday against Everton. If Trippier gets booked, he's suspended for this week. So the only reason I see Trippier as an issue is he is on four yellow cards. So at some point, unless he can make it to 19 games and then the threshold increases to 10 yellow cards, Trippier is going to be suspended for a game. I don't actually mind it being this week simply because it's the most difficult fixture that they've got coming up. However, I could also kind of do with him based on the fact that I might need to use my transfers elsewhere. So I obviously don't know what's going to happen in the future. I guess, fingers crossed, that Trippier just doesn't pick up that fifth yellow at any point and that I can play him in game week 16. But we'll have to wait and see what happens on Thursday evening. But that's the only re reason that Trippier is an issue. I know he's expensive and I know I could use the money elsewhere to bring in Harlem. But for me... Trippier is almost a season keeper. I may well keep him for the rest of the season and I'm delighted to have him in my team. So Trippier is not an issue in and of himself apart from the four yellow cards. Taylor, as I said, isn't an issue just because he's a cheap player that actually has a decent fixture in blank game week 18 and I don't need five playing defenders. that will, I don't need five defenders that I'm happy playing every single week. Taylor, if I need him on the odd occasion, maybe he could do something for me and I'm happy just tucking him third sub every week apart from maybe blank game week 18 where I may well play him. So Trippier and Taylor... 
I'm hoping, assuming Trippier doesn't pick up the fifth yellow, that those two will be fine. The other three all provide issues, but Simakas for this week, I think should be fine based on the fact that he didn't get any minutes in game week 15. And I think therefore he should start against Crystal Palace. So from game week 17 onwards, I don't want to own Simakas. And I think Simakas provides a bit of an issue in my team because he's a minutes risk and the fixtures become more difficult for Liverpool. But specifically for game week 16, remember, I need to prioritise my transfers at the moment because I have lots of issues in my team. I don't think Simakas is an issue for game week 16. However, Liverpool are the early kickoff on Saturday. So it may well be that Simakas does get benched again and then I need to potentially remove him. But for now, I'm predicting that Simakas probably won't be an issue in my team. So I'm unlikely to use a transfer there for game week 16. So let's say optimistically Trippier doesn't pick up the fifth yellow. Taylor, Trippier, Simakas are fine, which leaves Reese James and Gahey. Reese James unsurprisingly turned out to be a bit of a naff transfer simply because he still doesn't look fully fit. Apparently the reason that he didn't start against Manchester United in game at 15 was because he had a bit of knee pain, which obviously isn't ideal. Chelsea don't look fantastic defensively. And even when Rhys James is on the pitch, I mean, he made two or three huge errors against Manchester United, which could have led to goals. So I'm not overly happy with that transfer. Could I reverse it this week? Could I remove Rhys James and bring in someone else? There is a high possibility of that. I suppose my issue is I just don't like any of the defenders at the moment. We'll move on to my watch list in the final sort of couple of sections and look at the players that I could bring in. There are pretty much zero defenders that I actually want to own at the moment. I mean, if you were thinking on a wildcard right now, you can do this task yourself. Which five defenders would you choose in a wildcard? It will take you a while to put that together. Usually there are like three or four that are obvious and then it's just making a 50-50 decision between a couple and then you just pick a cheap player as your fifth defender. I would find it incredibly difficult on a wildcard at the moment to pick five defenders that I actually want to own. So yes, Reese James might leave, but I don't really see that many better options. And on top of that, as well as Reese James, I do have Gay Hugh. I think he's as big of an issue, if not even bigger, simply because of the fixtures. From now, I don't want to play Gay Hugh in any week. I don't like the fixtures for Crystal Palace. They look really, really poor. They looked poor again in game week 15. I just think they have a lot of injuries and they're just not performing to the standards that we've seen across the last two years. So I think if I were to prioritise, as I said, which is sort of the name of the game this week for game week 16, the issue, I think Gahey is the biggest issue for me simply because of the fixtures. So he would probably be the first one to be sold. So if I am to use a defensive transfer, it's probably Gahey to someone else. However, Reese James is more expensive and he's stinking up the team a little bit. So I could use either a second transfer on James, or if I want to bring in a more expensive defender, it may be that Gahey survives one more week and I remove Reese James instead. I do think there is a high possibility that I use a defensive transfer this week. So we'll discuss the defenders that I'm looking at in the watch list section a bit later. But I guess if Trippier does escape without a fifth yellow and I've got Simakas, I just need one more defender this week, which I'm happy to play. Reese James could be fine. So it may well be that I don't need a third defender this week, but it's really not looking good at the moment. So it doesn't get much better when we move on to the midfield, but I'll start with the players that aren't really an issue. Game week 16, Salah is not an issue for me. I don't think it's a great fixture away at Selhurst Park. Palace are a little bit better at home, but we've seen recently with the injuries that they've got and the performances that they're putting in, I wouldn't be surprised if Liverpool do put three or four goals past Palace. So Salah will almost definitely be my captain. And I don't feel like I need to remove him for this week. And unless something happens tomorrow, I'm recording this again on Wednesday evening. Unless something happens tomorrow when Spurs play against West Ham, then I don't feel the need to sell Kyungmin Son either. No, it's not a great fixture against Newcastle. And yes, I do have Son against Trippier. But when I have so many other issues in my team, Son just doesn't feel like a priority transfer out. So Son and Salah are fine. And to be honest, so is Bukayo Saka in terms of staying in my team longer term. I don't need to remove Bukayo Saka, but he does have a very tricky fixture this week against Aston Villa away. And we've just seen Aston Villa kept out one of the best attacks in the league in Man City. And I mean, they didn't even concede a single chance post the 11th minute. So this is not a good fixture at all. It's the reason that Martinelli is on the bench at the moment for me, because I am not backing Arsenal to get many goals, if any, away at Villa Park. But for, for the long term, and again, for this week, because he's on pens, he's on some set pieces, and you know he'll start, Saka will be in my 11, but I'm not expecting much from him. Which then leaves two midfielders that pro could potentially be issues for me in game at 16 for different reasons. I'll start with Martinelli. It was great to get a return from Martinelli in game week 15, but he did come off early once again. He was hobbling at points as well. I don't know if there was a bit of a knock. I was expecting him to come off at half time. So maybe that was the main reason for the early sub, but his minutes aren't completely secure. 
Trossard is playing very well. Yes, Trossard seems to be preferred as the number eight or as through the center if Gabriel Jesus doesn't play. But I do still feel like at some point we could see a Martinelli rest. I don't think it will be in this fixture. But at the same time, I don't want double Arsenal attack against Aston Villa away. That feels like a terrible set up for this week. So ideally, I don't play Martelli this week, which then makes me think maybe this is the week to take Martelli out. The next three fixtures aren't ideal for Arsenal. I don't think Martelli has been at it this season. His data has still been pretty poor. So is this the time to take him out? Potentially, especially when you consider his pricing, I can get to pretty much most midfielders that I would want. And I'll probably have some money in the bank as a result. So Martelli... The plan for Game Week 16 is always to remove Martinelli. It just depends. Do I want to prioritize the transfers in the defense? And then the final thing is, is Brian Embermo going to be fit? Because if he's not, and then we've got blank Game Week 18 coming up, and then Embermo's off to AFCON, this probably is a decent opportunity to sell him. If he's not going to play in the Sheffield United fixture, I don't want him for the blank 18, then he's off to AFCON. So I think I would probably use this opportunity to move Embermo on and bring in another midfielder. I think, anyway, at the moment, the current plan is probably to use a transfer in the defense and then probably use the other one in the midfield. So I think it will be Gehi out and then one of Martinelli and Burmo out. And most of the options that I'm looking at are quite a bit cheaper than Burmo and Martinelli, although there are two or three slightly more expensive options, which we'll discuss in the watch list section, which may mean that I would have to take out Martinelli if I wanted to afford them. I don't know what's going to happen with Mbermo at the moment. Again, I'm recording this directly after the game. The injury was so bad, though, at least for him pain-wise, that he couldn't even make it to halftime. He got subbed around the 40th minute. Normally, players try and make it to halftime. So that would make me think that it's not great. And again, Brentford playing only in a few days. So my early prediction would probably be that Mbermo doesn't feature. But of course, we'll wait for the press conference updates. We'll wait for any news that we get. And that will allow us to make the most informed decision. But I would be expecting this week that one of Embermo or Martinelli make way. If Embermo's fit, of course, it won't be him. I'd sell Martinelli. If there are any doubts, I might be forced to keep Embermo just in case. But hopefully we do get a definitive answer. So that's the midfield. I'll discuss my potential transfer options, like I said, in the watch list section. Because there are maybe five or six players that I'm currently considering. Let's move on to the three forwards. So moving on to the three forwards, and believe it or not, despite the absence of Erling Haaland, these are probably the three that I'm happiest with for game at 16. And I just think there are maybe bigger issues in my defensive midfield at the moment that I need to sort. I will discuss Erling Haaland in a second because the plan was always to bring him in for 16. But if you watch my deadline stream, you'll know that the plan is now not to bring him in. But I'll discuss the pros and cons of either bringing him in now or waiting a little bit later. Darwin not starting in 15 obviously wasn't ideal because it was a great fixture. However, it now makes me think, I'm never certain with Darwin, but I'm pretty sure that Darwin should get the nod in game at 16. And it's the same situation with Simicast. Despite the fact that it wasn't great that Simicast and Darwin didn't start in 15, it now makes me more confident of a start this week. And to be honest, that is great because my team is a bit of a mess. And just having a little bit more security in my head that my three Liverpool assets will start is a major advantage for me and my team. So, yeah, not ideal for game at 15, but it is a little bit better for 16. Again, Liverpool are the early kickoff on Saturday. So we may get team news around Darwin, Simicast, Salah, etc. And that may alter my thinking. But at the moment, I'm predicting a start for all three, which is brilliant. This may be Darwin's last week in my team, simply because minutes aren't great. Like, they aren't perfect anyway. And from 17 onwards, the fixtures do get a little bit trickier for Liverpool. So it might be the last hurrah for Darwin, but I also might keep him just a little bit longer. Watkins... I wouldn't have minded benching Watkins here because I know Villa are great at home and I know Arsenal have conceded quite a few goals recently. Conceding three to Luton wasn't ideal, but I do still think Arsenal are the best defence in the league at the moment. And I do still feel like this is a tricky fixture for Aston Villa, despite how good their home form has been. However, Watkins does score in big games. Villa are really one of the best teams in Europe at home, if not the best team. And Arsenal have conceded big chances recently. And I think it's mainly been down to individual errors and mistakes, but regardless of what it is, they are still conceding chances. So do I think Villa will score here? Yes. And when they do score, there's always a good chance that Ollie Watkins is involved. So for that reason, I'm actually perfectly happy starting Watkins this week. And I probably will regardless of the transfers that I make, which then brings us on to the 11th player, obviously in the starting 11, which is Julian Alvarez. It is nice having a bit of Man City attacking cover, even though it doesn't really work like that for the Luton away game. I'm just a little bit concerned that Alvarez has had a lot of early subs recently and his performances, look away from FPL for a second, have not been particularly good. I don't think the role that Alvarez is playing right now suits Alvarez. I think Alvarez 
is an out and out number nine that is playing the role that he is due to the absence of Kevin De Bruyne and also due to the fact that they have Erling Haaland but they also want to get Alvarez on the pitch. So I don't think this role particularly suits him and I think that is starting to show a little bit in his performances. And again, I also follow a lot of City accounts on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, that aren't involved in FPL that are calling for Alvarez to get a bit of a rest and to get some rotation too. So I always do worry week on week that he won't get a start, but he does continue to start. This feels like a game where we could see a bit more rotation than usual for Man City for two reasons. Lots of games coming up recently. It's Luton away and Luton, with no disrespect to them, they have put in a great performance against Arsenal. They are one of the easier teams to play in the Premier League. And there have been so many games recently for Man City that a lot of the players look fatigued. And I will put Haaland in there as well. I'm not for a second telling you that Haaland's going to be benched. But if there is a week, as I said this week in game week 15 for Liverpool and Salah, if there is a game to give either Alvarez and or Haaland a rest, this is the one. Whether that be from the start or whether that be an early sub, I'm a little bit worried about City rotation this week. I don't think we'll get any early team news, sadly, on Manchester City. So I'm just hoping that Alvarez starts. I don't think, unless we get anything definitive, that I can bench him. But I am just a bit worried about his minutes here. And we'll just have to wait and see because the performances haven't been ideal. But he has still put, been putting up okay data. So those are my 11 players. Just to recap in terms of how I'm seeing the, the priority for my transfers. Because, again, if I was wildcarding now, I could make seven or eight changes here. But I can't obviously make them in one or two weeks. So where are the issues? I think that unless Trippier suspended, he's fine. So the defense really for me is Simakas and Gehi long-term, but Simakas is fine this week. So this week, game at 16, Gehi, I find to be a bit of an issue. And also maybe Reese James, depending on whether we predict a start for him based on recent performances and fitness. So defensively, I could see myself making one or two transfers. In the midfield, Sakason Salah are fine. Embermo is fine if he's fit. If not, he is the biggest priority transfer out. And if he is fit, then I still think Martinelli would come out. The three forwards are fine for now, but I do acknowledge that I don't have Erling Haaland. So before we actually move on to the next session, next section, let's discuss Erling Haaland and why I'm not currently planning on bringing him in. To bring in Haaland, I would need to use three transfers, which would be a minus four hit, which isn't the end of the world, but I would... As part of that minus four, the only way that I can really afford it, unless I also take a, another minus four, so a minus eight in total, I do have to sell Ollie Watkins, which I, I'm not a massive fan of. This week, I don't think it's terrible, but moving forward, I'm not a fan of. And it would mean that my next three transfers are all revolving around bringing Haaland back in rather than sorting out the pressing issues in my team, such as the defense and maybe a Marcelian and Burma, whatever the issues do end up being for game week 16. So... I'm not wasting three transfers, but I'm losing three transfers that I could use to sort out the rest of my team. And it's not just Haaland versus no Haaland. The rest of the team does matter. So I kind of want to use my transfers to sort out my team rather than just shoehorning a player that I want to bring back in into my team. The other thing is if I sell Watkins, I think it does push me towards a free hit in 18. The reason for that is Watkins is the best captain, in my opinion, in game week 18. I would have no Aston Villa players. And again, I would then have less transfers to start moving my team towards a better team for blank game week 18. If I don't bring Haaland in, some of my other transfers could be revolving around bringing in players such as Livramento or even a Maguire or Shaw. These players have decent fixture in blank game week 18. The other thing to note is that in game week 20, Salah and Son, or game week 21, it is Salah and Son go off to AFCON and the Asian Cup, which means I will have funds and transfers then to then bring Haaland back in anyway. So in that case, because I would have to take out Salah and Son anyway, I'm not wasting transfers on Haaland. It's just one extra one to shift the funds into the attack. So I just feel like the more natural moving point for my team to get Haaland back in, where I have to use those transfers anyway, is probably in game week 19 or game week 20. So the plan at the moment is to bring Haaland back in for game week 20 when he's got Sheffield United at home and a possible double game week and probably go without him for, for the next few. It does mean as well, I have more money invested into my team for blank game week 18. It means I can save the free here and I can use my next few transfers on sorting out my team. So it's not that I think, again, Haaland against Luton away, great. It would probably be the best captaincy option. But I just think for the rest of my team and optimizing as much points that I can get across my entire team as possible, I think it genuinely does make more sense to go without Haaland until game week 20. So that is the current plan. It means that I do have more transfers now to sort out the other issues in my team. So let's take a look at my watch list and what my current plan transfers are. 
So I've just spoken about all of the major issues in my team at the moment, of which there are quite a few. But the more pressing issue, I think, is that I don't want to own anyone. <laughs> like, I was trying to put together this watch list, and apart from obviously having Haaland back in my team, like, there really aren't that many players that I want to own. And it's not to say that there won't be players that do well, but I'm finding it very difficult to select the players that I do think will perform over the coming game week. So I have put together a watch list, and of course the focus is on defenders and midfielders, because at the time of me recording this anyway, the current plan is to make one defensive transfer and one midfield transfer. So here is my list, but I'm not overly excited by any of these options. And the defense in particular feels very, very difficult for me to predict. The midfielders, I'm like, do you know what? A few of these could do very well. The defenders, I'm really struggling. So let's very briefly run through them. Ruben Diaz is on there simply because City's fixtures do improve. And whilst there is a blank game week 18, I think due to the defenders that I currently have and plan to own, I can probably get away with having an, one more player, especially a defender, blanking in game week 18. And I just think that the City defence can be relied upon over a longer period of time. And when there aren't any other standout options, maybe I do try and back the clean sheets. But I feel like also at the same time, this season, it seems to be that we want to back the attacking defenders because clean sheets are very unpredictable. So bringing in a player with very limited attacking threat and to be honest, very limited bonus points potential feels a little bit safe, boring and probably not the best play at the moment. So speaking of a player with less clean sheet potential, but more attacking potential, Pedro Porro is still up there for me as one of the better defenders to own. I'd love to see how he obviously gets on in game week 15 before recording this, but I can't. But he's playing against West Ham tomorrow. We'll see how Spurs look defensively. We'll see if he continues in this attacking role. But Pedro Porro feels like a very good transfer. And you could even go for you doggy if you wanted to save some money too. Probably one of the ones I like more, but he is also pretty expensive. And there's a chance I either don't have that money or don't want to invest money into my defense at the moment when they're just not keeping the clean sheets to warrant or justify that price. Livramento is comfortably my favorite option but you can see that he's not in orange and by the way the players in orange are the ones that I like the most at the moment the reason Livramento isn't in orange is simply because I've already got Dubravka and Trippier and if I bring in Livramento it limits me in that I can't get Gordon I can't get Isaac I can't get Wilson and I might not want these players right now but there's also a chance that I don't want to transfer out Trippier, Livermento, and in particular Dubravka, because goalkeeper transfers aren't the best use of your transfers. And then I may be stuck with triple defense and no way to get an attacker in without two transfers. So I don't tend to like filling up a third spot, especially when there are other players that I might want from that team. So that's the only thing putting me off Livermento. I do have Colwell on here. I also think Badia Shield could be a decent shout, but I think there will be rotation for all of the Chelsea defenders. I already own Reese James and I've not been overly impressed with Chelsea in their last few. So for me, Chelsea feel like a bit of a wait and see despite, or at least offensively, despite the brilliant fixtures that they've got coming up. I'm just a little bit worried about rotation and whether it's going to be worth bringing in their assets. Especially like Colwell, Dezassi, Badia Shield. I know Colwell's just recently scored, but they don't have massive upside. So for now, I'm less convinced by the Chelsea defenders. Trent and Shaw are two of my favorite options at the moment. Trent in particular, I love him, but he is 8 million. The only reason he's on here is I can switch to a 4-4-2 or a 3-4-3, or a I suppose, or a 3-5-2 and just bench one of my other players but or play like a really bad budget option in the attack. But more likely it would be a switch to a 4-4-2. And what I would do is I would sell Embermo or Marcinelli all the way down to bench fodder and then bring in Trent for Reese James. I'm not as keen on this because I don't think Reese James is the biggest issue in my defense. I don't really like having that much money invested in the defense and also Liverpool's fixtures do become tricky very soon. So I think I might have slightly missed the boat on Trent and I also don't like what it does. I don't like what it does to my structure. I think you've either got to have Trippier or Trent or neither by the way but I think Trippier and Trent feels like a bit too much money invested into the defense, especially with, like I said, Liverpool's fixtures starting to get tricky very soon. I've got Luke Shaw on there. At the moment, the most likely player for me to bring in simply because Manchester United have got an okay fixture in 16 against Bournemouth at home, even though Bournemouth have been good recently. Man United are actually keeping some clean sheets. They're not all full defensively. And I just don't like many of the other options. And at least he takes some set pieces. Even when he plays centre-back, he's still on set pieces. He's good for bonus points. And in the weeks where I need a defender, Luke Shaw doesn't have a terrible fixture. And the same goes for Harry Maguire. Luke Shaw would definitely be the one I'd want to own simply because he's better for bonus points and he takes set pieces. So I think there's more routes to points. But Maguire is almost a million pound cheaper. So if I do want to downgrade the defense and remove a bit of money there, I could end up going for Harry Maguire. So 
in some sort of weird twisted events, I, I'm somehow looking at a Manchester United defender, but no one's keeping clean sheets and none of these options particularly inspire me. So that's the issue that I'm having with defenders at the moment. Midfielders, there are, again, not that many options that I desperately want, but at the moment, it's Johnson, Sterling, Bowen, Foden, Palmer and Gordon are the ones that I'm currently looking at. I'd love to see how Bowen and Johnson get on again in game week 15 before making a decision. Not that that will massively impact my thinking, but if West Ham look good and Bowen scores, then maybe it will lean me in that way. Or if Johnson starts again and looks good once again, then maybe I'll lean that way. But I think the two that I am most interested in are Palmer and Gordon. It's been that way for a while. Palmer getting on the score sheet once again. This was his first from open play. His data has been pretty good and Chelsea's fixtures are looking very good. Now, despite the fact their performances haven't been great, I am still interested in Palmer for his price on penalties. And with the fixtures improving, you would expect Chelsea to improve too. So Palmer is still just about my favoured option, but I also think Gordon could do very well over the upcoming fixtures, especially in 17, 18, 19. Despite two of those games being away, they do look like good fixtures for Newcastle from an attacking perspective. So at the moment, one of Palmer and Gordon is most likely to come in, and I'm just about leaning Palmer. Foden is on there. Luton away is a nice fixture. Foden has played most of the games this season for Man City, but his data's not been great. And I also, like I said, do think there'll be some rotation against Luton. I think this is a fixture where we could see Pep make three or four changes to their starting eleven at least. So I wonder, is it the week to bring him in? And is, is it just a bit of like sentimentality and a bit of nostalgia? Because I've done very well when I've brought in Foden in the past, but maybe this isn't the time at the moment. So I think to recap the midfield, all of these could be options. It's probably Palmer or Gordon, but I am slightly tempted by Bowen. And it probably is a good point to now switch over and just show you the Fantasy Football Hub recommended transfers for my team. Is Martinelli to Bowen or Embermo to Bowen? or Martinelli to Palmer. So they offer sort of a few different ones and you can see by the graphs, they project based on the, obviously the transfer that you make and why they think it's the one to make, but they do back Bowen. And I am thinking, is the only reason that I'm not looking at Bowen more because I've just taken him out and it's like, I've just sold him. I don't want to bring him back in. But is he one of the better options at that price? Probably. So there is a chance that I do make the either Martinelli to Bowen move or in Burmo to Bowen. But if I do in Burmo to Bowen, then I have to downgrade the defender to free up a little bit of funding. So there's the possibility to bring in Bowen, but I am probably still leaning Palmer or Gordon, but we'll assess what happens on Thursday evening. And then just to finish up with the forwards, I'm not going to make a forward transfer this week, I don't think, but I'm interested in both Semenyo and Solanke simply because the fixtures in 17, 18, 19 for Bournemouth are very strong. I do still like the look of Izak as well, but Wilson is nearing a return to fitness. And I think that there will be rotation once Wilson's back. And of course, Erling Haaland is on the watch list, but the current plan is to not bring him in now and to wait until game week 20. So hopefully that does clear it up. If I was if I was going to make a move right now, if the deadline was right this second, it would probably be Gahey to Shaw and Embermo or Martinelli, depending on who I want to take out, to Palmer. So those are probably the plan transfers, but that will almost definitely change across the next couple of days. Let me know down below what your plan is for game week 16. So guys, there you have it. That is my game week 16 team selection. Hopefully you did enjoy it and apologies for the bit of sort of chaos in my brain and it being a bit more scrambled than usual. That is because of the impending deadline, but also the amount of issues that we have in our teams in general in FPL at the moment. And it feels very unpredictable, which makes it obviously more difficult to create content. But hopefully you did still get some value and entertainment from today's video. And if you did, please do smash the like button and make sure to subscribe as well. I am trying to hit 110,000 subscribers by the end of the year and I would really, really appreciate the support. Until next time, thank you very much for watching. Cheers. Bye-bye.